without further ado, Office 365 Forensics, the, um, the forensically sound approach. And at the end of the day, you know, the transition from on-prem exchange servers to doing forensics in Microsoft's playground on their servers and in, in their backend data infrastructures has presented interesting forensic challenges. Because no longer am I able to put hands on the original, you know, the old traditional IIS logs. Now we're kind of working off of logs filtered by Microsoft and put into certain areas of Office 365. We now have to interpret, have to figure out what is the causa uh, causality with what creates these entries and what can I then learn from these logs to figure out an actor that has gained unauthorized access, usually through business email compromise or through password spray attacks to get into an account, and now what data is at risk of being accessed by an unauthorized third party. So where do we go first? For those of you that have done forensics in Office 365, the most important place you wanna go is under security and compliance, and there's something called the unified audit log. And the unified audit log is Microsoft's dump of several data sources into one location. And what you have produced from that is this unified audit log that allows you to pull auditable events that Microsoft has kind of, again, hand chosen for us to dump into one log that you can break down by users. So you'd go to search investigation, you'd be able to go to uh, audit log search, and then you'd be greeted with an interesting window, which we'll get to in a minute, to actually search through. There are some caveats, some very important forensic caveats to the unified audit log that if you're not aware of, you should be. Logouts are not captured. So if I'm a bad guy and I've logged into an email account, one of the questions I often get asked by law firms or clients, how long was the bad guy in our system? Email account. Logouts aren't captured. And there's, of course, a bunch of technical reasons for that, one of which is, you know, if I close the web browser by not clicking the logout button, I just click the X, close my session, Microsoft probably could log, you know, the latency or could probably log that my session's terminated. At the end of the day, they just don't. So I have a login event, I have no logout event. Was he in there for hours? Was he in there for days? Messages, specific viewed messages within an email account are not logged in the final auto log. So if I'm a bad guy and I'm in an email account and I've logged in with username and password and I'm viewing emails in your email account, the viewed messages themselves are not captured in the unified auto log. Search terms being run. Again, not, not actually captured there. Was an attachment viewed? Um, for a lot of the investigations that my team does, we're often asked, you know, the body of the email is not the important part. It doesn't have the PII or the PHI, the HIPAA data. It's the attachment. It's the Excel spreadsheet that contains 10,000 user records with social security number, date of birth, et cetera. Was that attachment viewed? Unified Autolog doesn't tell me. So usually I take the position that if I know that the bad guy was in the account, based on the Unified Audit Log, likely the contents of that account are at least at risk. Those are the limitations that Microsoft has kind of strapped us with from this one data source. Length of session I already spoke about. This is the one thing, this is the nightmare that you'd never ever want to see as an instant responder if you've logged into a client's Office 365 tenant, and that is that the Audit Log is not turned on. Because now you have a significant issue. I have now lost one of my primary forensic data sets to help tell you, the client, what the actor did when he was in your email account. By default, this is not on. So any time that we get engaged, one of the first things we usually do is ask the client, do you know if you have unified audit logging turned on? And for about a quarter of our clients, they have no idea what we're talking about. For about another percentage of our clients, they're like, yes, and we just turned it on when we found out about this event, so it's now capturing data. Great, doesn't help me for the last 30 days. Um, or you, know, you have a proactive IT group and they're like, yes, that was turned on, we have log data. Excellent. If not, though, you're greeted with this screen where you then have to turn it on. It takes about 24 or so hours. A little hard to see on the screen, I apologize. Bottom left there, though, it says, because you started recording user and admin activities within the past 24 hours, some activities may not show up. And depending on the size of the tenant, and depending, and what I mean by that is depending on the amount of users um, in the tenant based on the licensing, Sometimes it will take 24 hours before log data starts getting streamed and pulled into that. If it's a smaller tenant and it's on one of Microsoft's newer servers or it's uh, been a more recently subscribed tenant, 
Usually it's within hours we can start seeing data. It may not be complete, but you'll start actually seeing data populate in there. So what's one of the first things you need to do as an incident responder? And it's establish a global admin account. Now Microsoft's got an interesting tier to the user accounts. And you can be a global admin, you can be a normal user, or you can be uh, a member of one of many user kind of levels, if you will. But global admin, think of it as domain admin. It is, a, it is your power user within the tenant. But even as a global admin, I still do not have 100% capabilities across the tenant. I still need to be assigned roles. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. There's a role particularly you need if you want to actually download PSTs or search the results of a content search. Know your environment. This is probably one of the more important slides. If you have not done Office 365 forensics, these are the areas, the first three are the areas within O365 where you will be focused the most on. Protection.office.com gets you to the security and compliance portal which allows you to access the Unified Auto Log, and it allows you to access the content search, which allows you to do searches within user accounts for particular messages and generate PSTs that you can download and do offline forensics on. The O365 Admin Center is where you can look up users. And I've been engaged um, on intrusion investigations where we've been told by the client, we know there was you know, phishing emails being sent out from this one particular user, or there was you know, something fishy going on with this account, emails were being deleted or marked as read, and I go in here and the client had deleted the account and created the user another account. Well, as soon as they did that, they, br they break the linkage with an Office 365 to the Unified Auto Log for that user. So if you try searching for that user, you will not find any logs. You have about a 30-day window to restore that account. The restoration will relink the logs for you and you'll be able to rerun a search query within the Unified Audit Log. So the admin center is where you will spend a lot of your time if you're looking at particular users, you wanna see what their titles are, you wanna see how they're configured within the tenant, um, what licensing is assigned to them. It gives you, I kind, of, I kind of equate it to metadata about the user, and it may help you with your investigation. Windows Azure. So for those of you that know Azure and the environment, it's kind of, I would kind of equate it to Amazon AWS. You know, at the end of the day, you can spin up servers, but it also, by default, depending on the licensing level of your tenant, has Active Directory resources in it. And we're gonna talk about some of the forensic artifacts that are relevant there to Office 365 and email accounts specifically. And then the last one, Windows PowerShell. I don't know Nathan personally. I've gotten to talk to him over email a couple times. Really good guy. He wrote a tool called PShell for O365. You can Google it and find it off a, uh, there's a third party website that posted his article in the tool. What's great about the tool is that it has bundled with it all the dependencies and the PowerShell commandlets for all of Office 365, Azure, um, OneDrive, uh, SharePoint. All of those are pre-bundled. When you run his installer, you have all of the commandlets loaded on your local system so that you can actually enter if you need to into PowerShell. And I have some PowerShell queries I'll show you in a bit where by default, logging in from a normal Windows stock machine, you're not able to run those commandlets without this. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. As most of us as seasoned investigators, we understand if there's something wrong within an account, we need to identify which account's at risk. And usually with a typical business email compromise uh, life cycle, usually someone has found out about it because they've either A, you know, admitted, hey, I found a, I had a weird link and it was for a document or it was for an invoice and I had to go and it, and it asked me to log in my credentials and of course you're going, and they've kind of self-admitted. Or all of a sudden you're, you have a report that a user's email account was sending out messages asking for something and it's like hundreds of messages going out. That's a clue. Um, so you usually know, uh, those of us that do this, which email account needs to actually be investigated and now we have our, our accounts we're gonna pivot off of for the evidence. So exporting the log, the Unified Auto Log. This is the screen I was mentioning. So when you go to search and compliance, and you go specifically to that, it loads this screen. Allows you to run a search of a particular user, or users, you can do multiple. Um, I, I, at the end of the day, it's, you know, depending on what tool you're using, Splunk or Excel or, you know, whatever tool you uh, might prefer, it may be helpful to download one log per user and try to separate those events. Um, I've, I've seen users and, and incident responders that will try to load up, you know, 
15 e uh, email addresses into this box, and you get a really large file, and they're all meshed together. Again, it, you know, it depends on, I guess, your preference for analysis. I like running it and getting the individual log files so I can kind of see what happened, and then I'll merge them together based on what's relevant. Because again, you're, if you're doing an incident response investigation for actor activity, most likely you're also gonna, going to see legitimate account activity. So now you have to try to correlate yourself as the incident responder, what's bad, what's good, you know, the good guy in his account using Outlook, bad guy in the account using a web browser, and then I need to separate that out. And it becomes a little more convoluted if you're running, you know, 15 something users all through this search screen. By default, once logging the course turned on, I have seen logs available for 30 days, up to 90 days, and I've seen some larger tenants available for about six months worth of data. Um, you, there is a PowerShell query. You can change the default setting up to, I believe, the 180 day mark. I do not believe you can exceed that, at least I've never seen any documentation, and when I've tried via PowerShell to exceed that, I usually get an error message. I do know that Microsoft can exceed that number. Um, I was dealing with one client who had two years of unified audit log data, which blew my mind. It was an immense amount of data, and we uh, were just amazed because when you bring up the calendar, I don't think I have a slide. Um, when you bring up the calendar, it actually shows you uh, color-coded dates for what days have logs available, and I just kept going back and back and like, surely there's something wrong, and I pulled a log from like two years prior and it actually had data in it found out they had had a prior issue, they had reached out to Microsoft, and Microsoft kind of flipped the magic switch and gave them longer retention data. So Microsoft Humor. Um, I have found significant issues with trying to run this search uh, engine, if you will, and typing in users if you're using Chrome or Firefox. Um, in fact, when I have tried with those browsers, even with the newer versions, you start typing in there, the cursor actually disappears and lets you and, and keeps you from typing. It's a really weird bug, but of course, Microsoft's browsers work just perfectly. So again, I don't, I'm not sure if that's just something odd with my testing or if that's a Microsoft joke to try to prevent uh, force people to use their browsers. Um, one requirement, I mentioned the content search. I think I mentioned it twice so far. The content search allows you to download PSTs for users that you can do offline forensics. That export tool that Microsoft has created requires an, in a Microsoft-based browser. The little plugin that loads, I have not had any success with it loading in a, a non-Microsoft browser. And Azure AD, which we'll talk about in a bit, same functionality. Some of the search fields, some of the search boxes, some of the sliders, it just, it will not render as well unless you're using Edge or IE 11. Under the Searching um, the search window that we were talking about a couple screens ago. In the top right hand corner is where you download the results of your search. Let me go back for just a quick minute here. Which may be easier said than done because I forgot how many slides it was back. This might have been a bad idea. Sorry about that. I thought I had a screen a couple back that actually showed the, uh, the results a little bit better. Bear with me as I get back. Okay, in the top right hand corner though, here is where you'll export. Now, interesting nuance here. Save loaded results versus download all results. Kind of self-explanatory, but for those of you that may not have done this before, save loaded results will only download a JSON dump of what's loaded on the screen. And by default, it's, it's loading about one screen worth of data. And as you scroll down, it keeps loading more and more data into the browser. If you only do save loaded, it will only save out what is loaded on the screen versus download all results, which will dump everything responsive to the query you've executed. I have a little bit of a joke there that with the Microsoft Excel, I, this data is JSON and it does not render uh, super well in Excel, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So I, I made a chart for all of the operators or the auditable events that are captured as well as their default status by Microsoft, the unified auto log. A couple interesting, couple interesting ones here. A message being copied to another folder. That action is an auditable event, but it is not on by default if you are a delegate or if you are the account owner. So if I have an email account in Office 365 and I copy a message, that is not an audible event. If I'm an admin level user, it is. 
folder bind and message bind. Now, this, these are two are very interesting ones. So folder bind, a mailbox folder being accessed. Well, that can be extremely useful as, to an instant responder, right? If a bad guy has been in one of my user's email accounts, be extremely useful to know if a bad guy was traversing down through folder structures. Did he stay in my inbox? Or did he go to my doctor's folder with his rounding lists where he's been keeping my uh, patient PII and PHI for going back for years? Did he ever access that folder? Because that uh, changes a forensic finding of years worth of notifications now for the client, or bad guy was only looking for invoice data in the inbox. Not auditable for typical owner accounts. It cannot be configured, it cannot be turned on. When, if tra when you try it in PowerShell to force that operator to be logged, you'll get an error response back. So message bind being even more important, message being viewed in the preview pane or open. Now this is speaking to, if I log in, whether it's a legit user or a bad guy, into office365.com, and I'm looking at an email account via the web browser, and I'm clicking down through messages, or objects is how Microsoft refers to it in their nomenclature, all of the objects that are being viewed, viewed if you are a normal owner or a delegate, the clicking of those messages is not captured in the unified auto log. If you're an admin, interestingly enough, I have seen where it sometimes is and sometimes is not, regardless of it being on or off. No explanation for that. So the PowerShell query to force on certain operators that are not on by default is here. And of course, then you can comma separate the values of the operators that you want to turn on. By default, Microsoft does not have all of the operators on. Well, as we already discussed, by default, the logging's not even on. And then once you've turned it on, only a certain amount of operators are logged by default. So now you actually can go in yourself and turn on additional ones if they're supported. So now we're into the analysis of the unified auto log. Again, it's JSON data. It's a little ugly to look at in Excel, but just for ease, I brought it up here. And this is kind of a sanitized one, so apologies for the big black boxes. But at the end of the day, you have four main columns that you'll see in Excel when you open this up. Creation, date, and time, the user IDs of the user accounts you've exported, and then the operations, or the operators. These are the auditable events recorded down to the unified auto log. User logged in, files being accessed. The files being accessed and files being viewed uh, is actually very interesting because that speaks specifically to OneDrive and SharePoint activity. Now, a lot of the business email compromise cases I've worked over the years, typically the actors are getting in, they're looking at messages. We have seen a percentage of our cases, though, where the actors will actually host the file they're going to use for phishing on the compromised account's OneDrive or in their SharePoint. And you can actually see that activity, and it timelines out very well out of the unified auto log. So again, that's just kind of the highlight of the actual operators and how they correlate. And then the data that's in that JSON blob to the, to the right on that last screen, those are kind of the more granular effects. I have another screenshot of that. But the mailbox login is one of the most important if you're trying to pivot around actor timelines and their activity within an account. It's not as simple, though, as just looking for just one operator to identify when a user logged in. Microsoft is, uh, has several. In fact, this isn't even a complete list. I think there's eight. But these are the six that I see the most in the investigations that I've done. User logged in is the most basic. That is the easiest one to, uh, to search for or grep for. But the other ones that are here, depending on the client's uh, mail environment, the way they've got it set up, you may see all of these other types of logins to capture a username and password and an authentication event into the Office 365 account. Now, for the most part, user logged in is the default. If a bad guy is logging in via office365.com, via web browser, this is the one you'll see the most common. But depending on if the client's using some type of an ADFS or a hybrid environment where they still have Exchange on-prem, maybe they haven't migrated all their users into Office 365, or they're hosting, uh, locally, but they're using licensing in Office 365, a lot of those factors can affect the way Microsoft sees the authentication into their infrastructure, hence the different operators that may capture a login event. So you'd be remiss if when you load that data, you're only looking for user logged in, you may miss other types of login events. So here's that JSON blob I was talking about. And these are kind of the most important 
aspects of that. The creation time, what is the actual operator that you're caring about, the user logged in for, this, for the purposes of this uh, example, the, the IP address. Where is that person logging in from as far as an IP? The extended properties, the user agent. This is fantastic for baselining a user's account. You know, most of the times when my team is brought in, we don't know the user's environment, the client's environment, as well as the client's IT team. So I don't know what a normal user may be using at their system. Are they using the most ver recent version of Outlook? Are they a remote user? Are they using a browser when they're traveling? So I can go in here, we can pull this data out, and I can baseline an account's activity. Now, what are my outliers? Um, IP addresses are always geolocating to this one part of the United States. That's right where the headquarters is for this client. All of a sudden, I've got a login that's a significant outlier, and it's coming from a different part of the world. Now I have something to pivot off of very quickly, very easily. Same thing for the user agent string, though. Am I only ever seeing Outlook as the normal baseline activity for this client, and all of a sudden I see a web browser, and it's some odd version of Opera? That, that's an outlier, and now I can pivot off of that. And of course, the result status detail. Value success. I don't care about value fails, and you'll see a lot of failures when you're doing these types of logs. Filter them all out. I mean, at the end of the day, it may help give you some information, you know, someone beating on the door, someone trying passwords, but at the end of the day, I care about success. If there was an unauthorized access, I don't normally care. I care about the success, and this is where you would be able to go and pull that. Three more operators that are significantly important. Add mailbox permission, add recipient permission, and set mailbox. Set mailbox is the forensic artifact that is laid down the log when a change to the account has occurred. So at the point in time via PowerShell, via the interface, if I have changed a setting within the user's Office 365 account, there will be a set mailbox operator that records the moment in time that the changes have now taken effect on the account. This is a great one to pivot off of. Now I can just sort by set mailbox, because typically most users aren't changing core settings within their account. If I'm looking at accounts and I'm looking for settings, like an auto-forwarding rule being created, I can very quickly filter by this, and now I start to see the outliers. But the, AR, the add mailbox permission and recipient permission is significant, because if you have had a global admin account popped, and that bad guy has been able to leverage that account to log in. So just say Devin Ackerman is the global admin, his account gets popped, and now he's, that account is logging in and being set as a delegate on other email accounts. The add mailbox permission, recipient permission, will be recorded in the log for every account that my primary global admin is being used to log into. Those artifacts may not be on those users in their individual unified log, but I'll see it on the global admins, well, uh, UAL. So again, this, this is not rocket science for those of us that do this on a regular basis. I want to know, if I've had unauthorized access, when did it happen, and what else did the actor do in the account? So we're gonna baseline that user activity. We're gonna identify what is normal, what is legitimate, and now what is my outlier activity? And the outlier activity is what I'm gonna care about. I'm gonna use user agent strings like we talked about. Mail rule creation. Typically, I find that a lot of the uh, actors from Europe, from, um, I don't know, I'm trying not to name specific countries, but from the African region that are usually interested in monetary gain through wire transfer, uh, they will create mail rules. And they will create mail rules to either cover their tracks from the kind of the spam that they, they flood out, or they will create a mail rule to auto-delete responses, and they want to try to hide their activity as long as possible. So typically, mail users are not creating a lot of mail rules in their accounts. If mail rules have been created within a certain time, something to help rise to the top, if I'm looking at hundreds of accounts, to look for those outliers. In fact, as a good example, we're working a 191, 191 account breach right now. And one of the things we've done with this, this volume of accounts is A, is 191 the total? I mean, that's a lot of accounts that have had unauthorized access out of a 10, 12,000 uh, account tenant. One of the things we've been looking for is during the time we know of unauthorized access, who had mail rules? And we found another 49 accounts, and the mail rules were all malicious. It was a very quick way for us to pivot on that data and look for things. And the geolocation, the IP addresses. At the end of the day, whatever your preferred tool is. 
um, Splunk or another tool where you're doing geo data, uh, GeoIP lookups, something that helps you on a map identify what is normal for this client or these, for these user accounts and what is an outlier. Especially because most actors, in my experience, are not very original. Uh, they will usually come from the same area or the same data centers or the same VPN clients, and you can very quickly start kind of seeing that on a map. One thing to look for, in my experience, is the IP addresses you may see from a bad guy on one account. They may, especially if they're using like an IP Vanish or they're using some type of VPN client or an anonymizer service, they may get different IPs assigned to them over a period of time. But typically, they're from that same IP net block. And I've got a, a PowerShell query I'll show you you can use to search a, uh, an entire net block and make sure you're not missing particular other IPs that you may not have seen specifically in a log. This allows you to have a little more of a broader scalpel to see if there's other IPs from that same, from that same actor group. A couple examples of clients you may see in the unified audit log. And Microsoft's very proud of their products, right? So they're going to give you a very detailed information about Outlook if it's their product, their client. And then in my experience and looking at these logs, if it's not an Outlook client, they're like, eh, it's IMAP. <laughs> well, thanks, Microsoft. Uh, doesn't, you will notice they do not identify other non-Microsoft Outlook mail clients. And they literally let you know there's a protocol which is indicative of a non-Microsoft Outlook mail client accessing the account, which of course, you know, at the end of the day, I'll let you be the forensic verifiers on that, but in my opinion and through testing, normally means the possibility is there that at least uh, certain emails would have been allowed to be downloaded, if not a, a complete active sync of an email account. Going back to the rules we touched on briefly a minute ago. So these are the operators you would see inside that unified audit log. If a bad guy creates a mail rule to do whatever it is, whether it's auto forwarding, deleting messages based on certain keywords, these are the operators you would see written down to the log. And again, that's a change to the account. So forensically, you would see set mailbox as that last operator being recorded after the actor has gone and created the mail rule. Um, updated the content or the rules, um, the arguments for the rule, and you can actually see almost the seconds between the actor clicking the different uh, options within the mail rule things, and then when he hits save, that's when the set mailbox is written to the log. There is something extremely unique to Office 365 that is not reflected in the Microsoft client, Outlook mail client and that is another auto-forwarding feature. So you can auto-forward messages as a bad guy out of a victim's account using mail rule. You can also, in Office 365, go to Options, Mail, Accounts, Forwarding, and I can type in an email address here and say, keep a copy of forwarded messages so they still get delivered to the inbox. And now I have a second place I have to look as an instant responder to see if a bad guy has put an email address. And this, more times than not, is completely missed by InfoSec team's internal company. They know to go to look for mail rules. It's, it, mail rules have been around since as long as you know, Microsoft has had all earlier versions of Outlook. This is specific to Office 365, and the only way you'd be able to go in and find that is actually, you could do it via PowerShell or go into the user's account and manually go look for this. Here's the IP address examples I was telling you about. So if you want to search Unified Log from PowerShell, you're a command line guru, you want to dive in, this, this would be the command that you would issue from, the, uh, from PowerShell to actually search the Unified Audit Log. And this is actually search all Unified Audit Logs. So all of the Audit Logs for all of your users and your tenant, this is a quick way, quick down and dirty way. If you have some indicators of compromise, type them in, you give the dates, the start and the end, export to a CSV, and boom. Usually within seconds, this query can run, and it immediately can give you IPs, helping you identify other accounts that you may not know about. And the second example there is what I'd recommend if you're trying to do net block. So if you know I have a bad IP, it goes back to a hosting center, no legitimate activity, do a who is, do a, um, a DNS lookup, figure out what is the net block owned by that organization, I'd recommend you search the whole thing. You may find that actor is using other boxes from that hosting provider or other IPs within that, within that range. So beyond the unified outlog, in Azure, depending on the licensing of the tenant, usually it requires an E1 or an E3 licensing, there are a couple additional things that Microsoft has done to try to help instant responders 
pull out uh, suspicious activity. And you would see users flagged for risk and risky sign-ins, and those would be two very quick logs you'd go to. Usually these logs seven days or 30 days is the max they're available. So they're extremely volatile. So wrapping up real quick, because I think I'm pushing my time. If you want to jump to PowerShell, you can additionally do some interesting queries to pull out a massive amount of data about particular user accounts. Not necessarily of a lot of forensic interest, but it is some very interesting details about when, um, what auditable events are turned on for an account, when the last password reset was for the account, and some very interesting activity that may tell you uh, just general information about the user you're investigating. I talked briefly that a global admin does not have 100% rights within, an, within a tenant. You would need to, if you want to do PST forensics and look for other artifacts within that PST, you would need to assign the global admin an e-discovery admin role so that he can download the actual PST contents. So this was very briefly. Had an incident response scenario we were doing, had a, a couple emails for, that I pulled out of a PST, and hello, Frank, for our prior conversation, please let me know what you think about it. I'm thinking this looks a little odd. It was right during the um, unauthorized access. I thought this was the actor. It was. So Julie responds, excuse me, Frank responds, Julie, is this legitimate? Of course, now Julie is the account that has been popped and the actor is the one sending the messages out. Frank, yes it is. I sent it. Thank you, Mr. Actor, I appreciate that. So not gonna spend too much long on the email analysis, though you guys know what you're doing with that, right? At the end of the day, you're looking at the emails that may be of interest and may still be left over in the PST, and those, of course, help from a timeline analysis standpoint. If we know the actor was in the account and we're looking for particularly what they did, you may find some very interesting emails actually still left in the account. RSS subscriptions is a very popular folder I recommend you go look at. Actors love hiding messages there. It's a default folder that Microsoft has in Outlook. Almost no one ever uses it and it's a great spot where actors' rules will usually mark as read and move messages to there. Ver uh, second really funny scenario, phishing email with an attachment and received. Um, I, we identified through the PST forensics the message had been marked as read, so we knew it had the, act, the user, legitimate user, had clicked the link in the phishing email, he had gone to the website, submitted his credentials, he was arguing he had not done this. But I found an email that said, and him responding to the actor, send me something I can open or not, something that makes me feel uncomfortable. I usually get asked what can, by clients, I usually get asked what can we do to make sure that we protect and harden ourselves. You know, multi-factor authentication usually will nullify probably 99% of these types of attacks, right? If you're using single factor and a phishing page captures username and password, you're gonna have a little bit of an issue there. If you turn multi-factor on, of course, you're going to have that second level of factor, you're gonna have the token, it's much harder, for a bad guy to capture that. I have seen a trend where actors are starting to also put a token field on these fish kit pages, so it asks for username, password, and your token. And I've had some instances where users have given up their token. Token's usually good for 10, 15 minutes, depending on how it's configured, and the bad guy still gets in. So be aware of that. Um, but domain auto-forwarding blocks. You know, at the end of the day, auto-forwarding messages out of your tenant because a bad actor has created a mail rule is a significant issue. These would be ways where you can stop that. I've, in most clients I speak with and, and do the consulting work for, they're like, we don't have a legitimate reason to be sending messages outside of our tenant to an external third party. Microsoft gives you a PowerShell way to actually block that tenant wide, and those messages, if they do are attempt to be auto-forwarded, they will get dropped and they will not be delivered successfully. And that's it. Well, questions.